In this video, I'm going to go over the different kinds of flash media and their adapters that I use when I'm swapping out the spinning hard drives in old PCs. I'll also go over the different software that I use to read and write hard drive images to those flash media, both from on the vintage hardware itself and also on a modern PC. So first, starting out with the different kinds of flash media, the ones I use the most are compact flash. A couple things to consider with compact flash. First, of course, you have the capacity. You don't necessarily want a huge card that was larger than anything available at the time. The computer may not be able to recognize it. Another big factor is the speed of the card. Similar to CD-ROMs, this will be a number like 133X. This card here that says CF300, which would be 300X. Here's a quick chart on how these speed ratings relate to the theoretical maximum transfer of the drives. You can see the 133X is 20 megabytes per second. The 300 is 45 megabytes per second. We have to say the 800X, which is 120 megabytes per second. So when you're using this as an IDE drive replacement, the IDE channel is kind of maxed out at 133 megabytes per second. So anything faster will be wasted. But also older PCs use older specs that can't even go that fast. So I have no problems using these 133X cards on Librettos and DOS and Windows 95, 98. Final point on compact flash is if it's an industrial card or not. A key benefit with industrial cards is they're marked as fixed disks, whereas most commercial off-the-shelf compact flash cards are marked as removable drives. There are some utilities that kind of claim that they can change this removable bit, but generally this isn't going to work. This really doesn't come into play until Windows XP and newer, because it watches for if it's a removable drive, and if it is, it won't let you put your swap file onto it, which makes sense because Windows would probably crash if you were able to pull out the drive with your swap file in the middle of your session. The easiest way to work around this is to use the Hitachi filter driver. I cover that more at the end of the video. Some other issues I've run into with newer operating systems like Windows 7, if you're trying to set up a dual boot, if it's a removable drive, Windows will only allow you to have one primary partition. It won't even see the other ones. So the installer will block installing a second operating system. So next up we have SD cards, either full-sized or micro SD in an adapter like this one. I don't use a lot of SD cards. The adapters tend to be a little bit more expensive because Compact Flash is basically just IDE, so it needs a super simple adapter, whereas SD cards need more chips and logic. But then again, SD cards are a little bit more readily available today and cheaper. Next up is MSATA. These look similar to modern M2 drives, but they're not compatible. It's basically a shrunk down SATA drive. These work especially well starting with XP and newer operating systems since they're standard fixed disk, non-removable drives. They're pretty much faster than any interface you're going to plug it into, so it'll never be a bottleneck. They're also really cheap to pick up used on, say, eBay, especially for the capacity. You can easily get a 128 gigabyte MSATA drive for under 20 bucks, and there's no way you're going to find a compact flash card of that size for that price. Next up is an M2 drive. This is what pretty much all modern machines use. They're either NVMe, which is really fast, or they're still available in SATA. I have seen some adapters that will use an M2 SATA drive. And finally, a standard 2.5 inch SSD. If you have a laptop with a standard SATA interface and right now it has a spinning hard drive, this is a super simple just drop in replacement. Recently, some brand new, super cheap 2.5 inch PADA slash ID drives started to appear. But looking at reviews, it seemed to be kind of questionable quality. And I'd personally rather use my own flash memory and adapters. So let's start looking at standard 2.5 inch IDE hard drives. These have 44 pins versus the standard 40 pins on a full sized IDE drive. The connector itself is also smaller and it's able to carry power over the connector, so you don't need a separate Molex power connector, like a full sized IDE drive. Now, note that there's different thicknesses to these drives, so you'll need to be careful when you're getting an adapter or a drive that'll fit into your bay. Next, let's look at some 44 pin IDE flash adapters. Now I'll include links to these in the description. The first is this dual Saiba compact flash adapter, although I generally only use it with a single compact flash card. One note, it generally needs some modification. You see this pin here 
I had to cut that pin out. Otherwise it won't plug into a keyed motherboard connector. You can just compare it to a regular drive to see which pin. There's also some user pictures on Amazon. Otherwise I like this adapter since it's the same form factor as a two and a half inch drive. It has all the same mounting holes, so it's easier to put in a caddy or some drives will have handles that'll screw onto them to make them easier to pull out of the laptop. And here's where you see that you need to take the thickness of the drive into account. For example, this ID adapter may not fit into the same spot this hard drive came from. It's thicker. This next one I use quite a bit. It's just a simple compact flash to 44 pin IDE. Super simple since compact flash is basically just IDE, so there's no chips to it. Now I buy these things in bulk off AliExpress for super cheap, but otherwise you can get them on Amazon, eBay. The pins stick out a bit at the bottom of, I think this is the drive select jumper, so I like to snip them off to make sure they don't poke something underneath the drive. You can use these adapters as is, or you can 3D print some different cases for them. I found a couple of different models online on Thingiverse and printables. You can see they kind of have some different spacing for the screw holes, different ways the card mounts. I think these little adapters and compact flashcards are probably light enough that you can just kind of plug them into the motherboard ID port and just kind of let them dangle in the air. Sometimes I stick them down with some double-sided tape. I'll also take a few moments here to demo how these work. Next up, we have an SD card adapter. I've never personally used this. I think you have better availability on the SD cards themselves, but the adapters are more expensive because as you can see here, it takes a lot more logic to convert the SD to an IDE interface. Now this is an adapter I started picking up more recently. You can see it has a nice thin case with the factory mounting holes and it converts an mSATA drive to IDE. So this will work great with your Windows XP and newer machines. You can also easily pull out the little mSATA drive when you're dumping it or writing an image to it. It'll be a lot faster than the native IDE port. So when I am transferring from a old hard drive onto my computer, I use this adapter. And there's a SATA port. You have a 40 pin IDE with a Molex cable for power and your 44 pin two and a half inch interface. It's got USB 3.0 as a DC power jack when you're using the Molex connector for three and a half inch hard drives. This Rosal one's been discontinued but you can find the exact same thing with different branding on it. Next here are some smaller 1.8 inch hard drives used in smaller sub notebooks. There's a couple different interfaces on these. See, this one has a 50 pin connector. It's keyed with the round peg being near pin one, but it's slightly offset. It's three pins and you can see the black marker there showing where pin one is. So far, I've only come across these in Toshiba laptops. They're made by Toshiba. This next drive uses a 40 pin ZIF connector you can see it's noticeably thinner than the other drive. There's a connector on the back that you lift up to be able to insert in a ribbon cable. Push it back down to lock it in. So far I've come across these in little Sony Vio sub notebooks. I think they're also used in hard drive based iPods. Here's an example of the ribbon cable. You notice that there's only connectors on one side. Next up is an example of a factory SSD, also with the ZIF connector. This one came out of a Sony Vio. It's one of the very first consumer SSDs. It's definitely way better than a spinning 1.8 inch hard drive, which is usually only 4200 RPM, but still not too impressive by today's standards. It's usually faster and bigger capacities. So checking out 50 pin adapters, it's a simple 50 pin to compact flash adapter. 
Now sometimes you need to cut off these little wings here to be able to fit into the factory connector. And I like to snip off the pins on the jumper there that stick out a lot through the bottom. Probably use these the most. They're light enough that they can just be supported in midair or a little double-sided tape to hold them in place. So taking a look at an adapter that lets you copy files off a 50 pin hard drive to your modern PC, this is pretty much the only solution I've found. I haven't really found any adapters that adapt this to like a 44 pin or a 40 pin. And then you can use a standard USB adapter. But this little USB drive bay has a 50 pin connector, USB 2.0. It's a little tricky to plug it in, but it works great. And next up, we have a compact flash to ZIF adapter. Now these normally come with some ribbon cables, although you won't typically need to use them. You'll use the cable off the motherboard. They come with two. There's like this blue on both ends and a white on one end. The blue end goes into the connector. And I believe that Hitachi drives would connect with the blue end as well, which is a little thicker whereas the white end is more for Toshiba drives and should be thinner. And now because of this difference in thickness, sometimes the motherboard cable will be really loose into your adapter. You can fix this by using a little Kapton tape, which is non-conductive, making sure you stick it on the side without the connectors, just to make it a little thicker so it stays tighter into the connector. I've also seen some of these adapters come with ribbon cables where the white end is just as thick as the blue end and it won't actually plug into your drive. Now next up, I've recently come across this Ziff SSD on eBay for under 30 bucks. Now this comes with a modern M2 SATA drive. I haven't been able to find the bare adapter for sale, but really for this price, you're not really gonna find much better. I benchmarked at about 400 megabyte read, 300 write, which is gonna be faster than anything using this ZIF interface. And of course the big benefit is it's a real hard drive, not compact flash. I recently had a problem on a Sony U1 where the factory recovery CDs didn't want to install onto a compact flash card, even though Windows itself was fine installing to it. So this is a ZIF to 40 pin IDE adapter. I picked this up when I was trying to transfer files off a ZIP drive onto a modern PC with a USB adapter, but I didn't have much luck with it. First, this was one of those that came with the white cable that didn't actually fit into my drive. So I replaced it with a, another cable that did fit. Here's a comparison on the two cables. You may not be able to tell it here. I don't know if I have a defective one, but I was never able to see any drives connected through this adapter. So here's a zip adapter that did work for me. I'm not sure why you'd ever actually use this in a real device converting a slow zip drive to SATA. But plugging my drive into here and SATA into my USB adapter, I was able to copy files off the drive. And my final zip adapter, this one worked with no issues. Comes with a built-in USB 2.0 interface. The cable worked fine. No issues copying data off the drive to my PC. Next, let's look at SATA drives, starting with two and a half inch drives. Now in this case, if you have a two and a half inch spinning hard drive, the easiest replacement is just a two and a half inch SSD drive, which are easily available brand new today. Now here's kind of a weird adapter that adapts full size SATA to compact flash. I'm not sure why you'd ever use anything like this, but it is a possibility. Now here's an adapter I've used a couple times. This is a 1.8 inch micro SATA to M SATA adapter. So it's a miniaturized version of the full SATA connector. So things like the Sony VAIO P-Series use this, and you can use a standard M SATA drive. And this is different than the modern M2 SATA drives. Next, we have an adapter with a standard SATA connector, two and a half inch. This one's got a frame, so you can put it into factory mounts. And then it takes a M SATA drive. Next, we have another two and a half inch M SATA to set a drive adapter. This one's a little nicer since it's fully encased, so it looks like a normal drive. You have all your standard mounting holes. And 
This final adapter is more for desktops, so you can replace a standard 3.5 inch 40 pin IDE drive with a more modern SATA 2.5 inch SSD drive. Next I'll quickly touch on two adapters that you can use to quickly transfer files to and from a vintage laptop. First, USB. Now you may or may not have USB ports. If you do, it might just be the slower 1.0 or 1.1 slot, but you can use a PC card to add USB 2.0 ports. Now this is a card bus card, you can tell by the gold connector on the bottom, so it's only going to work in newer laptops. You need to check the specs. For example, the Libretto 70CT doesn't have card bus, but the 1110CT does. Typically, the easiest way is going to be to use a compact flash PCMCIA adapter. So you can just copy files through a card reader under the compact flash on your desktop and transfer it over. This is the easiest you can run Windows on the laptop. So let's talk about the best way to make images of your hard drive while still within the computer. For a lot of these little sub notebooks, the hard drive is kind of buried in the machine. It's not easily accessible without tearing it all down again. So being able to make an image without having to open it up again saves a lot of time. You may want to do this for your own personal backup, or you may have come across a computer that has the factory Windows install or recovery partition with drivers, something that's not been archived online that you want to make available to others. And along those same lines, you can use these same techniques to write an image that you've downloaded from the internet onto your drive. The main tool I use for this personally is Semantics Ghost 11.5.1. Now I like this tool because I've used it a lot in the past. It also runs in a WinPE environment. This is kind of a mini version of Windows. This is nice because you could use tools like Disk Part to work with drives. But it's also really nice because you can plug in USB flash drives or hard drives, plug and unplug, hot swap them, and use them as storage for the images. Now, Ghost is an older program. Like I said, I like 11.5. Kind of search on the internet to find it. This is the first result on archive.org. It most likely should work. This is the one that I use. You see the ISO image about 140 megabytes. This is the one that you want to use around this size. There's also a DOS-based ISO that's only a couple megabytes, but you lose all the benefits of WinPE with USB support. Now you can burn this to a CD. You can also use something like Rufus or Ventoys to make a bootable USB flash drive, although a lot of really old notebooks can't boot off a of USB. So I'm going to show you how to use Ghost to write and read images. Now one nice thing is you can just copy over your Ghost executables onto a modern Windows 11 machine. That way if you are able to pull your original drive, plug it into a USB adapter, or you want to prepare your new drive before you install it in the machine, you can do so. So I'm going to show you here how this works. Now had I booted off the CD, I'd get the same interface, there'd be a command prompt window behind here too that I could swap to if I needed to use disk part or other utilities. But here's ghost, hit OK. Pretty much everything you need is in this local menu. So if I was going to create an image, I'd say local. You could do a partition. If you wanted to copy just a partition, I generally do a disk. So your disk, you can copy it to another disk or to an image and do to an image. So now I find the drive that I'm going to use. In this case, I have a 64 gigabyte SSD from a Sony Vio UX plugged into a USB adapter. I pick the drive. Now I need to choose the destination. So in this case, if I'd put it off a live CD, I'd want to put it onto like a flash drive. Give it our name, UX, save. 
I normally do fast compression. It doesn't seem to be, cause any problems even on older slow machines. Proceed. Sometimes you'll get a message about the drive not being locked in case it wasn't properly shut down. Just checking the volume, checking the drives. There's four partitions on this drive, a Windows 7, a Vista, recovery partition, tiny boot partition. And it's going. See, we get speed, how much is copied, estimates. But I will cancel out of this. Now let me show how we restore a drive. Same basic process, local, disk, from an image, we browse to our image. You'd normally pick your flash drive or wherever it is. I'm gonna use this image here. We choose our destination the SSD, and we get to see the different partitions that are on this drive. So you can see it came with a system partition, the main Windows partition, and then the hard drive recovery partition. Now this happens to be an image created from a 64 gigabyte SSD. It's gonna go onto a 64 gigabyte SSD. You can image to a smaller or larger drive. You kind of adjust the different sizes here. So you can kind of see the original size that it was, how much of that's actually data. So you can see this had a 50 gigabyte partition, although there's only 17 gigabytes worth of data. But we could tweak this to say, you know, we want to make this only 32. Now we have free space and we can install like another operating system on. Kind of adjust these numbers. Hit OK. And then it would ask to overwrite. I'm not going to overwrite this drive, but if I had yes, it would start writing out the entire drive. One last tool that's part of Ghost is the Ghost Explorer. This is a nice tool because it lets you open up a Ghost image. With this, we can browse the contents of our hard drive images. We can extract out files. So if I were to open up that image, we can see the different partitions loading in. Here's the hidden recovery partition. We can like look at the files in it and come into the actual operating system. See here's like a, looks like a Toshiba tools. I can actually extract out these, save them. Now the other way I make images is to use the Linux style DD file. I use this HDDD raw copy tool from HDD Guru. It's a Windows application that makes DD compatible files. Looks like this. You just pick your source. If you were going to write an image to a drive, in this first step, picking the source, you would choose a file. Say we were going to make an image of the SSD. We choose that as the source. The destination, we could write it to a drive, or we could write it to a file. So here we'd open this up. We type in our file name. By default, it wants to make a raw image. This is an exact byte for byte copy of the hard drive. So if it's a 64 gigabyte hard drive, it's gonna make a 64 gigabyte file. It does have a compressed option. I avoid this because some of the other programs I use aren't compatible with this. So let's make a standard DD file. Save, continue, and it starts writing it. So you're more likely to have modern programs that can deal with a DD image file. For example, this OS mount utility. As you can see here, you can mount it, browse, you can mount in my previously created image file. You can see this is 60 gigabytes. Same thing in Ghost is 16. That's because we didn't use the compression option. If you were to zip this up though, it'd be just as small as this. If I mount this, continue. 
you have the option to mount uh, just partitions out of the drive. You can see, or I can mount the entire drive. And this gives us actual drive letters. So I can browse through that hard drive directly where Ghost had to use the Explorer program. See this drive had all the different installers in a folder, including the Japanese ones. It'd be useful to extract out. No, I haven't personally used it, but the same people make OSF clone. This is a ISO or USB bootable utility to create those DD images directly. You do this from the machine itself as an alternative to booting off a ghost disk. I believe this is Linux based and it does say that it will find USB connected drives to write images to. I'm not sure if that's automatic or you need to mount drives, but since I'm more familiar with Windows, that's why I use ghost. Now this final topic is something I've covered before in other videos, but to have it all in a central place here, to get around the restriction in Windows XP and newer, where they don't let you put your swap file onto a compact flash drive, which is marked removable, you can download and install the Hitachi filter driver. And to get it, come here, you need to install and modify this Hitachi micro drive filter. So you download this driver, the 32 bit driver, you kind of get the device ID of your flash card. You modify the Hitachi driver to stick your ID into it, replacing theirs. And then you force Windows to replace the existing driver with this new driver. And after I did that and rebooted, then when I went and checked the device manager, now instead of saying it was removable drive, it now said it was just a regular drive, fixed disk, and it had stuck the page file there automatically. So this concludes my overview video on storage and imaging. If anyone has any suggestions on other solutions, please let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.